Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is Friday, June 25th, 2021. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me also say too, for longtime viewers here, in the NBA, I still expect the Milwaukee Bucks, who lost game one, to beat the Atlanta Hawks in that series, right? I still like the Bucks in five and the Bucks in six. We'll see how game two turns out. But let's get back to boxing. Now, I'm an old timer. I'm in my 50s, right? So I was out yesterday having a few drinks with some guys who were probably... 20, 25 years younger than me. And I know that in boxing, younger generations forget what happened before them. Right? So, just like today's generation might believe that LeBron James is the best ball player in history, right? They barely remember Kobe, much less Michael Jordan. Right? Just like I don't remember. Well, Chamberlain. Right? In boxing, people's memories only go back so far. So one of the guys yesterday while we were having drinks talked about how Mike Tyson, who has a very successful podcast on the internet here, on YouTube, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson. Um, he was trying to say that one of the reasons why Tyson was such a great podcaster, and Tyson is excellent, was because Mike Tyson during his boxing career hardly got hit. And so Mike was very uh, well-spoken and eloquent. So I was sitting there and I was wondering, wow, does this guy realize that Buster Douglas hit Tyson with one of the better uppercuts in heavyweight history? I thought, does this guy realize that Lennox Lewis, a puncher, hit Tyson with a bevy of shots. How about the first Evander Holyfield fight, where Holyfield opens up the kitchen cabinet before getting the stoppage? This is before the ear-biting fight. How about the Danny Williams fight? Right? I, I challenge anyone to watch that fight and tell me Mike Tyson doesn't get hit with some huge shots. Right? So I... I understand from time to time, we have to remind each other, the generations have to get together and remind people how great fighters were tested and also great things in the past that fighters have done. Now, one of the most mind-blowing stats, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section of this YouTube video. To me, it's more impressive than Floyd Mayweather's 50-0 career record. Right? One of the most mind-blowing stats in boxing history, right? Mind-blowing is the idea that in going 50-0, I believe officially only one judge in a Mayweather fight scored the fight for Mayweather's opponent, right? These are the fights that went the distance. Obviously, the fights that Mayweather won by KO, and there are more of them than you think, are definitive. But in Mayweather fights that went the distance, only one judge, Tom Kazmarek, sat through a Floyd Mayweather fight and scored the fight for his opponent. And that opponent, who won Kaz Merrick's card 115 to 113, was Oscar De La Hoya. Right? By chance, I was in the sports book in Las Vegas. I used to go to Vegas more in the past than now, although I'll be back in Vegas. Right? And I would hang around the sports book. Being a a cheap SOB, I would hang around a sports book during fights because it was always festive, as you could imagine. People betting, 
Then they would disappear. The fight took place at the MGM in the Garden Arena, which was not far from the sports book. And I can tell you that after that fight ended, people came streaming into the sports book directly from the fight. And I can tell you that many of them, it, it, it wasn't fun. It almost looked like a riot was going to happen. Many of them were upset because they thought De La Hoya had won the fight. Now, only two other times that I'm aware of did a judge sit through a Floyd Mayweather fight and score the fight a draw. Right? Believe it or not, that didn't happen in either Castillo fight. I believe a good argument can be made that Castillo may have beaten Floyd the first fight, but that's not the way the judges saw it. No, the two guys who got draws against Floyd were Marcus Maidana, right? I mean draws on one judge's scorecard. Floyd won these fights. One's Marcus Maidana. The other was Saul Alvarez. So understand, De La Hoya right now is having a feud with Saul Alvarez. De La Hoya has signed to return to the ring. He's going to return to the ring against Victor Belfort, an MMA guy who actually throws an excellent left hand. But I believe De La Hoya's real game, because of what he's saying when he talks about Canelo, right? He is breaking down Canelo's game. He's talking about what he sees as flaws in Canelo's approach. And this is a guy, of course, who used to be Canelo's promoter. I understand. There's bad blood there. But I believe Oscar's real game is to work his way into a fight against Canelo. Right? I don't believe a boxing great, and folks need to understand, that's who De La Hoya was. I don't believe a boxing great would be wasting this much capital in analyzing a fighter and making public statements if he wasn't chomping at the bit to get in the ring with Canelo. Let me also say, too, that older fighters sometimes don't realize how old they are, right? They can see what another fighter is doing wrong. What they don't realize or may not realize is that now they're dealing with 40-odd-year-old reflexes, not 20-odd-year-old reflexes, right? De La Hoya might see a way to beat Canelo but might no longer have the physical attributes to do so. Let me also say, too, that as popular as Canelo is, and Canelo's very popular, right? you notice that there are a very large number of women at Canelo fights. right? He's very popular. But people need to understand that weigh-ins were dull. They weren't eventful until suddenly women started showing up at Oscar De La Hoya weigh-ins. Right? Understand, I believe boxing was caught off guard by this. That's when folks realized that they had to move the weigh-in to a bigger venue. And when they did, instead of dozens of women showing up, at an Oscar De La Hoya weigh-in, hundreds of women started showing up at Oscar De La Hoya weigh-ins. Right? It caught boxing by surprise. It really did. Right? Let me also say this, too. De La Hoya was so good that we know at least two very highly thought-of opponents in major fights against De La Hoya were juicing, right? We now know that Shane Mosley was on EPO at a minimum. 
um, a performance enhancer, a doper that's outlawed at the Olympics. When he fought De La Hoya, I believe, in the rematch. We also know that El Feroz, Fernando Vargas, who wanted a fight with De La Hoya for years, got one, enters the ring with Julio Cesar Chavez. We now know that El Feroz failed a post-fight drug test. In other words, De La Hoya was so good that some of his fiercest rivals tried to cut corners to beat him. Let me also say this too. I want you to look at De La Hoya's record carefully. I can tell you, being in my 50s, having been awake when I was younger during the De La Hoya era, not a toddler, but someone who actually was going to Vegas for De La Hoya fights, I can tell you that De La Hoya, in my eyes, clearly beats, and I mean clearly beats, Shane Mosley, I know this is not what Brian Kenny and Max Kellerman said during the live telecast, but on my scorecard, it's not close. He schooled Shane Mosley in the rematch. We'll give Shane the first fight. I thought Mosley clearly lost the rematch. There are two schools of thought on the De La Hoya Felix Trinidad fight. Understand, both agree. De La Hoya is winning that fight with three rounds to go. Right? De La Hoya is clearly outboxing Felix Trinidad. Understand, De La Hoya had legs. So De La Hoya could dance. He could move. Trinidad, by contrast, was robotic. Understand, too. Both guys were unbeaten at the time. Now, where the two schools of thought diverge is if you believe Trinidad won the fight, then you believe that Oscar, who was fresh, he's not battered, he's not hurt, he's not trying to just last till the final bell. No, he's dancing. Right? The people who think Trinidad won believe that Oscar ran the last three rounds of the fight. The people who believe Oscar won believe Oscar was up by several rounds and that Oscar just showed off great footwork the last three rounds of the fight. Right? I'll admit, when I saw the fight at the time, I thought Trinidad won the fight. As I've seen the fight in later years, I believe Oscar may have been robbed. Let's just say had they announced Oscar the winner of that fight, I don't believe anyone could have complained. Let's go one step further. Another fight in the Oscar De La Hoya biography. Oscar decides he's going to challenge middleweight champion Bernard Hopkins. Now, I want people to realize that Bernard Hopkins was a dominant middleweight champion. I know many of the younger people will be surprised to learn that Bernard Hopkins had a career before he became light heavyweight champion, right? Before he beats John Pascal. But Hopkins is one of history's dominant middleweight champions. Now let me just point out the obvious. Oscar wasn't a middleweight. Let me say something controversial here. I had Oscar winning the fight before he gets stopped on a liver shot. I'm not alone. One of the judges had Oscar winning the fight before he gets stopped on a liver shot. I challenge people to look at the tape. You're gonna notice that De La Hoya has faster hands than Bernard Hopkins. You're going to notice that De La Hoya puts his punches better, together better, than Bernard Hopkins. I thought Hopkins was fortunate to get the stoppage. Because had that fight gone the distance, I believe there would have been controversy. Two judges had Hopkins winning by a margin. Right? Let's just say 
the stoppage the first time in Oscar's career he was stopped, and it was not on a headshot. The stoppage, of course, removed all doubt. De La Hoya was only stopped one other time in his career, and that was his last fight, December of 2008. It's been that long, folks, 13 years, 12 and a half. And that was to Manny Pacquiao. Now, De La Hoya is overwhelmed in that fight, but understand, De La Hoya weighed in at 145 pounds. He looked weight-drained for that fight. He looked weight-drained for that fight. He was two pounds below the 147-pound welterweight limit. That fight ends with De La Hoya retiring in his corner. Pacquiao was dominant. That's a masterpiece fight. That's a reference point in boxing. But here again, in terms of De La Hoya's chin, he was stopped. Not by getting hit and dropped, but by getting outworked and tiring. Right, so understand, De La Hoya has a great resume. How does he win the Fernando Vargas fight? By stoppage. Right, De La Hoya has a great resume. De La Hoya also had some moments where, I know the scorecards don't reflect this, but at the time, when the 12th round started against I Corte, I'm telling you, having seen it on TV live, right? The feeling was the winner of the 12th round was going to be the winner of the fight. De La Hoya mixes it up with Ike Quarte, very dangerous fighter, and drops him in the round, right? De La Hoya really was a Hall of Fame boxer. I know many people consider him to be a promoter and stuff like that. Don't sleep on his credentials. Somebody yesterday, as I was out with a group of guys at the bar, said, why do they call De La Hoya the golden boy? I looked at the young guy and I had to explain to him that De La Hoya was the Olympic gold medal winner. He was unaware. Right? Let me just say, the problem I have with De La Hoya fighting Victor Belfort. And it is a problem, and it's one you need to look at carefully. Right? First is that we all live different lives outside of our profession. De La Hoya really was a Tiger Woods figure. And by that I mean he had a certain image in public that was different than his behavior in private, right? De La Hoya was involved with, we'll call it self-employed models. Uh, De La Hoya uh, may have taken uh, illegal substances. There might have been addiction issues. I'm not sure. But let's just say I know that De La Hoya outside the ring didn't have the reputation that someone like Canelo has of staying in the gym, right? Of living a life dedicated to his profession. That wasn't Oscar, nor was that Ray Leonard, nor was that Carlos Monzon, right? What we call a professional now has changed, right? Back in the day, a fighter like Ali, and I'm naming great fighters, a fighter like Ali could show up to a press conference with a woman who he was with. Some reporters, knowing Ali was married, could assume that the woman was Ali's wife and then find out that she wasn't. Right? Understand, 
fighters used to have private lives. I mean very private. Right? Fighters used to sometimes gain a lot of weight between fights. Now in this social media age, life's a little bit different. Right? Mike Tyson is not out in Manhattan, up by Dapper Dan's, up down, running into Mitch Green and having a fight between fights. Right? Life's changed. People are professional. Anthony Joshua, he's trying to hold it together. Right? These guys are in the gym. These guys have teams around them. These guys are all about being professional. That's not the way it used to be. Right? Back in the day, some guys were out on the town. I suspect that Oscar was one of them. So, when you see guys in the ring now at these celebrity matches, a guy like Anderson Silva, who recently beat a former boxing champion, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., a guy who went the distance with Canelo. Think about that. Right? You look at Anderson Silva and you realize that, wow, you know, this guy is made for these older fights because he's still in great shape. He still has stamina. You get the feeling he was a craftsman who kept himself in great shape throughout his career. I think Evander Holyfield is going to have a great career in these celebrity matches because Holyfield was always in shape. Right? A guy like Oscar, I really can't say that. You also look at the career progression and you wonder, how do you go from fighting for the middleweight championship, middleweight's 160. Understand, he fought Floyd at 154. What's he doing weighing in at 145 for the Pacquiao fight? What's he doing fighting down at 145? Right? Victor Belford, and this fight's between two guys in their 40s, was a great MMA fighter, is a striker. Right? This is not Ashgren. This is a guy who hits hard. He's a striker. Great left hand. Here's why I'm concerned about this fight. He was busted for steroids. That could make a big difference in your 40s. Baseball fans know that during the steroid era, it seemed like guys who were on the cream and the clear were doing things in their late 30s and early 40s that hadn't been done before by that age group in baseball history. Right now, Belford failed at least one performance-enhancing drug test. Belford later was on testosterone replacement therapy. Right now, if you're into weightlifting, if you've hung around a gym with barbells, you know that sometimes guys juice so much that their body shuts down. They actually need to replace the testosterone in their body. So sometimes guys who are complaining of low testosterone have low testosterone because they've been artificially enhancing their testosterone for years. Now. What I want people to do here, the only factual statements I'm making about Victor Belfort is that he was busted for performance enhancing drugs in the past and that he was on testosterone replacement therapy at some time in the past. Now, a huge problem I have with this fight is the fact that Oscar De La Hoya retired in 2008, 12 and a half years ago, right? December of 2008. Understand, Victor Belfort was fighting as recently as 2018. Right? He's been in a fighting contest. Right? Octagon or ring. 
within the last three years, Oscar hasn't been. So my fear here for gamblers, especially looking at Belfort's body, and if you track his body, you're going to notice that it changed somewhat, right? Belfort is a young man, no body fat whatsoever. Then there's a sudden change where his body starts to look more natural, right? Let's just say it's kind of like looking at these NFL players who used to be linemen, who have huge necks and muscles. Then when the guy retires, suddenly the guy looks like he's lost 40 pounds of muscle. Well, Belford still has a body that, to me, doesn't have hardly any body fat on it. So I'm just concerned that a guy who in the past has been on testosterone replacement therapy. I'm concerned as to whether that guy is going to be all natural against Oscar De La Hoya or whether Belfort might try to cut corners as some past De La Hoya opponents have done. Understand, we're not talking idle speculation here. It's happened to De La Hoya in the past. Right? He lost to Shane Mosley while Shane Mosley was enhanced. So, for gamblers, the red flags are out. De La Hoya had an excellent jab, and De La Hoya could move when he was a young man. Just understand that your legs are the first to go, right? Power, according to the old adage, is the last to go in boxing. So, someone like George Foreman could become heavyweight champion again in his 40s because Foreman, of course, still had that punch. You wonder if Foreman could have become heavyweight champion again if he had relied instead on his legs. So in a world where Anderson Silva recently beat Julio Cesar Chavez, right, I'm hesitant to bet on this De La Hoya fight, right? Part of it has to do with De La Hoya's length of time outside of the ring. Part of it has to do with the fact that De La Hoya has had out of the ring problems. Part of it also has to do with the testosterone replacement therapy history of his upcoming opponent. So my advice here to gamblers is to be careful, right? I'm not going to weigh in one way or the other. If both of these guys were in their prime, I would take De La Hoya without hesitation. Both of these guys are now in their 40s, right? I believe De La Hoya is the kind of guy who isn't someone who would be involved with testosterone replacement therapy, right? While that's admirable, I believe it could place him at a disadvantage if his opponent is allowed that therapeutic use. Right? Uh, I've been in weight rooms at gyms. I used to lift weights a little bit when I was younger. Obviously not now, but when I was younger. Right? I'm just telling you that a guy who's a regular weightlifter, who is on testosterone replacement therapy, might be in better shape than a guy who isn't. And understand, while everyone's in great shape in their 20s, in these fights involving guys in their 40s, the edge might go to the person who has kept themselves in great shape, who fought within the last three years, right? Who might be on testosterone 
replacement therapy now. I want the boxing press, I want the MMA press to ask the hard questions of both of these men in the lead up to the fight, right? So, as much as I like Oscar De La Hoya, and let me tell you folks, he was a great fighter, right? A great fighter. I didn't think he beat Pernell Whitaker, but let's just say he had his moments in that fight. Whitaker might not have had enough offense, right? This is a guy who fought, Hernando Hernandez, right? Excellent fighter. Julio Cesar Chavez, okay, Chavez was older. All right, fine. Pernell Whitaker, Felix Trinidad, Shane Mosley. Bernard Hopkins, El Feroz, Fernando Vargas, Ike Corte, Manny Pacquiao. De La Hoya didn't always come out on top. But let's just say you have to use both hands when you're talking about his biggest fights. Right? So, while I'm interested in seeing how the fight turns out, this is a fight where I'm going to be on the sidelines. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I'm not betting this fight. In the comment section of this video, tell us how you're playing it. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.